He was on dialysis, and now he's not. In this case study, I'm going to show you how a 72-year-old man named Mark, who came to us on dialysis, and who was told that he's going to need a kidney transplant, has been able to completely recover kidney function in three months to the point of no longer needing dialysis or a kidney transplant. And so, Mark is a 72-year-old former firefighter who had been battling chronic kidney disease for years, and this was secondary to a poorly managed diabetic condition. So he had diabetic nephropathy, and it damaged his kidneys over time. And his kidney function has slowly declined over the years, and of course this puts him at great risk of heart disease as well, which fortunately he wasn't dealing with yet. So as his kidney function declined, he was told his only real hope was a kidney transplant. However, there was a major problem here because the medical establishment refused to allow him the opportunity or the privilege to be put on the transplant donor list if he did not receive the COVID-19 vaccination because it was required for the transplant program. Even though his daughter offered to donate one of her kidneys in exchange for him being placed at the top of the transplant list, the doctor still refused. And because she was not a direct compatible donor to her father, uh, he was not able to receive her kidney either. And Mark refused to comply with this COVID-19 vaccine mandate. And so this left him in a very dire situation, and he felt like he was going to be trapped on dialysis indefinitely with no way out. He was losing all hope, and he lost faith in the standard medical system. That's when he came to us for some help. So Mark's symptoms were very serious. His kidneys weren't filtering toxins, and he felt like he was running on fumes. So he was very exhausted. Even getting up off the couch and walking across the room left him essentially out of breath, and his lower legs and his ankles and even parts of his abdomen were swollen. They were holding fluid. And this poor kidney function was also making it hard for him to breathe. He was having uh, you know, complications to where he was requiring to, uh, oxygen for some parts of the day. So he had oxygen at home and pretty much any time he would get up to walk across the room, he would require oxygen afterwards. And his red blood cell count and hemoglobin was also very low. Uh, but despite this, uh, the doctors didn't really do anything to help manage it. They had him on an EPO stimulating agent, which is vastly inferior to some newer treatments. And it, he was just not being treated well enough to get his hemoglobin up to acceptable levels. And the toxins that were accumulating in his blood from the impaired kidney function was also impairing his memory and affecting his mood. So he was getting very depressed and he was also suffering from uh, an extent of anxiety. I mean, uh, you know, it's very, very clear that you would in such a case like this. And he was also developing muscle cramps and weakness, which was due to electrolyte imbalances. And this was just causing him more pain. Uh, you know, Mark mentioned at night, especially some nights, he was just completely unable to sleep because his legs were cramping so bad that he would sometimes scream out in pain and he would have to stand up and like stretch them out and stuff, which left him essentially exhausted. And since his kidneys weren't producing enough EPO, like I mentioned, uh, they did put him on a medication, but it was just improperly managed. So his labs before treatment. He had a serum cystatin C, which is just a more direct measurement of the actual glomerular filtration rate, uh, was in the dialysis category. It was a 2.8 milligrams per liter. Uh, very, very poor. This should be way higher than that. And his estimated glomerular filtration rate, which is an estimation of the kidney's function based on creatinine levels, uh, also put him at 11, which is stage 5 chronic kidney disease. So uh, that also uh, is at a level which typically does always require dialysis. His albumin to globulin ratio was 0 0.7. Uh, this means that due to the damaged glomeruli in his kidneys, they were unable to filter albumin. Normally that would filter through the kidneys and be put back into the blood. But in his case, it was coming out in his urine and this was causing a very foamy urine, uh, proteinuria is what it's called, uh, the, when the kidney is leaking albumin. 
And this also increased systemic inflammation and it puts his uh, immune system uh, at risk. It's definitely compromised, especially in addition to the diabetes, which he had. So normally this level should be significantly over one, ideally. And his hemoglobin was also 9.5 grams per deciliter, which indicates a severe anemia. So this is why he was becoming essentially out of breath uh, just from standing up and walking across the room. He doesn't have enough hemoglobin in his blood to transport oxygen to his tissues. And so in order to determine the best combination of peptides, supplements, and medications, as well as diet for Mark, we, of course, we did a deep dive call with him where we took a comprehensive health history and his current protocols, which he is following and what he has been doing over the past few years. And we followed that up with a comprehensive blood work and urinalysis uh, just to assess more information. Very important biomarkers need to be taken into account when building a program like this. And so first we checked like his red blood cell and hemoglobin count. We did a complete blood count with uh, differential and we also screen for any potential autoimmune conditions, which could have led to the kidney failure, essentially. Uh, in his case, he did not have any autoimmune conditions. He just had uh, diabetic nephropathy. So uncontrolled diabetes for so long, combined with an old age at 72, uh, just severely compromised his kidney function. We did a comprehensive organ biomarkers for the kidney, the liver, and also his heart, because we were quite concerned uh, definitely being in kidney failure and also having a chronic unmanaged diabetes puts you at risk for heart failure. So we definitely wanted to evaluate that. And it was also very important to take a look at his thyroid function, because if we're going to change his medications from an erythropoietin stimulating agent uh, to another class of medications, it's very important that his thyroid is optimal because it'll actually determine which specific medication we put them on. Uh, for instance, Roxadustat is a HIF prolohydroxylase inhibitor, which uh, basic, basically somewhat to some extent uh, mimics the body's natural response to hypoxia. Not exactly because it does function a little bit differently, but just to give you an idea of how it functions, that's essentially its essence. And this stimulates the kidneys to produce more EPO, which goes to signal the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells and hemoglobin. However, uh, one thing with Roxadustat is that it can be contraindicated in patients who have a history of thyroid dysfunction. And so we would have to use a different alternative hif hydroxylase inhibitor if this applied to Mark. And so also electrolyte stability is very important to assess uh, what we need to focus on in terms of electrolyte status and also to help prevent uh, further cardiovascular complications and also improperly uh, manage electrolytes if we do switch them to different medications because uh, we can't have like potassium go way too high for instance it could cause all sorts of problems and also we don't want to have a lack of sodium but being that his kidneys were severely compromised and the kidneys are generally pretty good at holding on to sodium, it was much of a less uh, concern for Mark. The main concern would have been the potassium. And also we looked at a host of other metabolic factors. Now, we could have done genetic analysis during this process, which we call our Genomic Risk Prevention and Enhancement Service. However, for Mark, this was just not necessary. We were already, um, we already had all the information that we needed in order to address his treatment protocol for his condition. And so we utilized four powerful peptides for kidney regeneration and enhanced EPO production. And one of these peptides is actually IV administered in clinic. Now it doesn't have to be, okay? Um, you could take this peptide also orally. It's just that the advantages to using this certain one IV is that it allows us to reach much higher blood level concentrations and it could rapidly improve kidney filtration beyond what it uh, could do so orally. And uh, in Mark's case, he was already used to dialysis. 
Uh, he was a tough guy. You know, dialysis can be very, very painful to the filter. Uh, your blood when you're hooked up to machines. And so a, a simple IV, of course, that's nothing to mark. I mean, it's, it's obvious, you know, uh, we're healing his kidneys here. He didn't mind a little IV. And so these peptides have been shown to not only regenerate the kidney tubules, but reduce inflammation, enhance filtration, uh, significantly raising glomular filtration rate. And so we also implemented a profoundly kidney protective medication, which would also control his diabetes. So one of the most powerful kidney protective medications that are available today for diabetics are called SGLT2 inhibitors. And so his doctors only had him on metformin, which is better than absolutely nothing, but it is very far from ideal, especially for somebody who has uh, stage five kidney failure, right? So we hand selected a particular SGLT2 inhibitor, which made the most sense for his specific conditions, biomarkers, and history. And one specific supplement we implemented was to target the kidney fibrosis. So uh, this is essentially scar tissue in the kidneys glomeruli which can severely compromise its function and essentially make it uh, dysfunctional and unable to even uh, function because scar tissue is always weaker than healthy tissue. And so if you can actually address some of the fibrosis which has set in, then you can essentially regenerate the kidneys to a much stronger capacity. And this also include uh, improved bun. So we also implemented specific vitamins and minerals, which were carefully selected to reduce oxidative stress and protect kidney tubules. But we were very cautious in the specific ones that we implemented because we do not want to overload somebody on certain ones when his kidneys are compromised. And we targeted electrolyte rebalancing so that we could avoid further kidney stress and cardiovascular complications while addressing some of these muscle cramps that Mark was dealing with. And this also included plenty of antioxidant to support to prevent additional kidney destruction. So within six weeks of implementing this protocol, the results were really, really remarkable. His cystatin C levels already started to improve dramatically, which was putting him just on the borderline of the dialysis level uh, range. And his albumin globulin ratio normalized, which reduced a lot of systemic inflammation. This means that Mark had less protein in his urine. And so this is a result of the kidneys functioning much better. And some of his edema disappeared. He was having far less fluid retention. And he was even able to start walking across the room without being fatigued and out of breath. He was very rarely using his oxygen at this point. And prior to this program, he was on oxygen for the past year. So this resolved a lot of the chronic fatigue that he was dealing with. And of course, his brain fog also started to dissipate as his mental clarity came back. And of course, the blood work did confirm the kidney function improvement, as I mentioned, with the cystatin C improving, as well as the albumin and globulin ratio. So lab results after three months of treatment, this was after a full health transformation program. His cystatin C went up to 1.4, which was a massive improvement over what it was. His EGFR has over tri uh, basically tripled. So he's out of stage five chronic kidney disease, his albumin to globulin ratio is one to one, which indicates uh, pretty much normal function. And the protein urea is very, very minimal leakage. Uh, there was almost no albumin detected in the urine. And his hemoglobin was much higher. So he no longer has anemia. And by month two, he was also able to reduce his dialysis sessions. By month three, he was able to completely stop his dialysis. So this was quite an incredible transformation because uh, normally you would expect something as severe as chronic kidney disease to take a significant amount of time to actually reverse, but we were able to do it in just a matter of three months. And here is Mark's testimonial. 
I was told I'd need dialysis for life, that I had no chance of getting a kidney transplant unless I got vaccinated, that my kidneys couldn't recover. But here I am living proof that they were wrong. This program didn't just give me my kidney function back, it gave me my life back. I can breathe normally again, I don't feel like I'm dying from exhaustion anymore, and most importantly, I have hope of making it to 80 years old. I can't thank you guys enough. I thought my life was over, and instead I got a second chance. So, Mark's case proves that kidney regeneration is indeed possible, contrary to what traditional medicine or big pharma may say. We can heal your kidneys, you just need to have the right strategy. So if you or someone you love has kidney disease, is undergoing dialysis treatment right now, or has a worsening kidney function, uh, don't wait. You don't have to accept this fate of going into kidney failure and being on a lifelong dialysis or getting a kidney transplant. You can regenerate your own kidneys with the right approach. And so for a total health transformation, just go to peptides.link slash transformation. This has been Brendan Henry, the world's leading expert in peptide science. And thank you for listening to my case study. Have a good day.